In this episode, I speak to Douglas Squirrel about his response to being fired consistently because he was too good at his job. We discuss why talented maverick leaders tend not to stay in organisations and take their talents into their own businesses. Willing to do something that is not normally associated with your job title is the maverick way. Douglas talks about Bing's AI-assisted search engine and whether it's a controlled failure and planned strategy one week before Microsoft restricted Bing's output. This is a conversation on how to build trusting teams and how C-suite leaders should do nothing as a springboard to talk about controlled failure and how it brings teams together. Douglas shares his take on the lad of inference and how to break down someone's story into small steps and how do they get to where they are now. I create clear thinking and decisive leaders who can amplify their influence. Contact me to find out how I can help you or your organisation. And today, my guest is Douglas Squirrel. Hi, Douglas. Hello, Judith. How are you? I'm good. What about you? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful sunny day here in England, and I'm uh, just next to my stream outside the the house, um, flowing by in a beautiful February day. You know what? That is very picturesque. I like the way that you visually explained that to me. So tell us about you. So the brief uh, story of me is that, uh, uh, first of all, I'm English, despite my funny way of speaking. So uh, uh, get that out of the way first. But um, the way I came to be talking to you is that uh, I got fired over and over again in the nicest possible way. And I kept getting fired because I built my teams too well. And the founder of the company would come to me and say, Squirrel, you've built this great team and they're doing this fantastic job and you've trained a leader and they're doing wonderful things. And gosh, there's not so much for you to do anymore. And man, the the uh, team seems to be just uh, doing very well without you. Uh, so why don't you go and do something uh, and be wonderful somewhere else? And um, uh, after the third or fourth of those, I said, well, gee, maybe I should plan for this. So uh, I became a consultant and I began working with loads and loads of different teams. I've got up to about 185 now that I've worked with in the past eight years. So I move very fast and I've discovered all kinds of wonderful things about helping teams uh, work much more quickly, much more efficiently and uh, building trust and confidence and accountability. That's very cool. But I'm imagining people listening here who want to be great leaders just heard your story and died a little inside there. Yep. Uh, believe me, I did the first time I got fired. I thought it was terrible. I was angry. I was miserable. I thought this was bad news. By the third or fourth time, I said, maybe this is actually a good thing. Maybe I should be working myself out of a job, and maybe I could plan for that and make it successful for me. And, and that's how I'd suggest your listeners think about it. Did you think that once that you've got your team all working really well, Without you, you were able to do more in your role besides having to manage tasks. Oh, absolutely. And that was really valuable. So I was able to do that quickly at the beginning. But what would happen at these organizations, and and I should say these are quite small startups, so this is not Google or or Facebook or something. This is um, very small but very fast-growing companies. And what would happen is that uh, they really didn't need me anymore. And, And that was a good thing. Once I began to, to recognize that and see how valuable it was actually to get me out of the way, that's when a consulting model made much more sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Because, I mean, I I had something similar in the sense when I was in corporate land on the basis that it over time, you know, I'd be hired to fix, you know, HR teams that weren't mm-hmm. working well. And then over time, you suddenly... Re- you just get good at it. it doesn't take as long as it used to and then um I used to have a phrase which would be I will train a responsible adult to run HR and then I'll go play with the exec team exactly and, then, and for me I expanded up my role into into ops and you know outside of just the data kept the strategic side of HR of course but the day-to-day running I had people that would do that do you think if you was in a a larger organization, you would have done something similar, or do you think you'd have just left? Uh, Good question. And um, I never really liked very large organizations, so I never gravitated toward them. I imagine that's true. Um, My co-author, who has a very similar um, uh, job history to me, 
uh, didn't become a consultant. He did stay, and his small company got bought by a slightly larger one, which got by, bought by a larger one. So, so he kind of got swallowed by the beast. And, and so that's what he does now: is he he has all these strategic roles in in sequence, and he trains responsible adults to run his teams. So I wouldn't be surprised if that uh, would have happened. But uh, you know, I'm having such fun being a consultant that I'm I'm very happy it worked out the way it did. No, no, I, I I totally get that. And I think it's a good way. I think that um, especially maverick leaders are best as consultants, whether it's internally or externally, uh-huh. because their ability to see all the different converging parts and then make something of a new hold out of it is, is quite good. And I certainly realised that I started to plan for, actually, I'm only going to be in an organisation for two years. Because, you know, my job is done. <laughs> and, I think, and I think, as you said, sometimes there's a reluctance from um, the C-suite or peers to give the level of autonomy and authority that's required to keep these individuals active and useful beyond what they were hired for. And I think that that serves out into a lot of people becoming um, consultants and their own business owners because they're striving to, to still achieve well, but with more autonomy. You got it. And, and, you know, we both had an interesting background because you're coming out of HR. I'm coming out of tech. Those are not traditional places for people to be significant um, influencers of the executive team. I claim both places are fantastic places for to grow and nurture those kinds of leaders. And you and I are examples of that. But um, it's an interest, interesting that from very different perspectives, very different origins, we, we wound up in similar places, um, uh, winding up doing that strategic work. Yeah, I'd imagine the magic nature is what brings it together, I think. <laughs> exactly. You have to be willing to take risks, willing to do something that people don't associate with your job title. Exactly. That's it. There you go. You, you've totally summed up my work history. <laughs> doing, doing things that would not be normally associated with my job title, that probably sums me up perfectly. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm kind of interested in how, how you build trust in teams quickly because i see oh, lots, wow. lots of leaders struggle to do that oh man i was just writing my weekly email for my squirrel squadron community about that uh, just this morning so uh uh one of the things that you can uh, i'll say how not to do it before i say how to do it because a lot of people do it in a very ineffective way yeah. uh, a lot of people try to go convince people of their idea and they say man i've got this approach and i've really figured it out and i listened to judith and she said this was good and squirrel said this was good and let's go do it and the problem is that doesn't build any trust at all. The problem is that puts people off because the more certain you are, the less people trust you. And this is counterintuitive because it sounds like, oh, I should be a confident leader. I should go and lead from the front and make sure people understand. That doesn't work. What I find, and, and us engineers are particularly um, susceptible to this because because we work with computers that are black and white. You know, there's a definite right answer. And so we tend to say, well, there's a definite right answer. We should all do this. Isn't it obvious? And that is completely unhelpful. What is much more helpful is to ask a lot of questions. And if you're genuinely curious, if you ask genuine questions that um, allow people to understand uh, that that you are interested in their ideas and that their ideas might change yours, then you learn what their story is. You learn how they're thinking about it. And so uh, one thing I often tell tech teams is stop um, telling other everybody else, we should build the tech this way. This is where we should go. This is the right answer. Ask them what they think whether or not you agree, and then you can use their language. You know what, this is so so interesting because I was coaching someone today and had a similar question when I, when I said that it's about, if you're a sort of person like how you mentioned there who is direct, not in a bad way, but, you know, you're very much like, oh, I know the answer to this, I know how to do this, but it's coming from, not because you haven't checked people, speak to people, so it's coming from actual knowledge as opposed mm-hmm. to just an opinion. You have to earn the right to be able to state things like that so boldly. And I was saying earning the right is without needing to give appeasing words or contextualising. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when I'm in a, when I'm in, you know, if someone's paying me to mentor them or I'm in a, a working with people I know very well I can just get to the point whereas 
if you're in a new surrounding people don't know you you have to say this is why I think we should do this I think the context is of this you know you have to explain it more because people just don't know you so they, so they make assumptions as to where your final statement has landed and, and and how you positioned that point you know they see an agenda that doesn't exist because they just don't know you yeah, but once indeed, you know, and right, they know you so you can just say you know what I squirrel I think you know we should just do this and then you would take that to mean you've done some research it's a curious statement you're not bound you know you have all this stuff already baked in and loaded so i i would i would go further than that so i i, I uh, and you and i may take different approaches here that would be fine but <laughs> the the way i would take it is i would say that even if you're explaining the context and, and us engineers we love to explain people say sometimes engineers don't like to talk we love to talk we'll tell you everything you'd like to know we'll use star trek analogies and um give you details you, about microservices yeah, and gpt3 you definitely got me on Star Trek analysis. That's there we it. go. Excellent. So, so, so we, we'll do all kinds of things to explain, and that doesn't help. Just explaining doesn't. But if if I could get the tech teams of the world to ask people questions more often about yeah. why they're thinking this, why the customer demands this. You know, I was just chatting to someone in Miami about um, uh, how his tech team uh, just never asked why it was they were getting too many demands. They just kept trying to meet the demands. I said, the first thing to do is go ask, find out what the reasoning is, and then you'll be able to use that language to come back and build trust with the other person. So that's the most important thing is, is uh, as I, I find, is not necessarily to explain first, but to ask questions first. Yeah. Exactly. And as I was saying to my coach today, so it's like, for me, questions is all diagnostic. Mm -hmm. But with people that I don't know who don't know me I have to explain I ask lots of questions because it's diagnostic yes it's just judge, judging the responses or the answers or the individual it's just how I diagnose is by asking questions and I think when you're when you haven't earned the right to just ask the questions you need to explain why you're asking the questions completely agree there and sometimes when I'm coaching people to ask more questions They'll come back to me and they'll they'll phone my squirrel phone. They they have access to me to to ask questions of me, and they'll come back and say, "Man, this person got very defensive when I asked questions." I said, "Did you yeah. remember to explain? <laughs> Why trying to understand their context, and then ask them a lot of questions?" Oh yeah, I forgot that part. <laughs> <laughs> that's so that's so interesting. Okay, let's listen to a quick advert. As a leader, you know that having a strong level of influence is essential to achieving your goals. But how do you know if you're truly making an impact? Take the How Influential Are You scorecard to get a clear picture of your current level of influence and identify areas for improvement. With personalised recommendations and valuable strategies, you'll be able to amplify your influence and make a real difference as a leader. Don't miss this opportunity to improve your leadership skills. Take the scorecard now at amplifyyourinfluence.com dot scoreapp.com welcome back to the maverick paradox this is the podcast for the pathologically curious so is there a set formula then and in getting teams because i do a, i do a lot of um high performance team either mentoring or training facilitation that kind of stuff sure would you would you say that there's like a a always work methodology to get teams working well together or do you say that they're all uniquely different and you start from scratch each time no i'd certainly say that the the first thing to do in in uh, almost every team is to build trust and uh i'll talk a minute in a minute about some some methods for that that build on what we were just talking about it occasionally happens that a team already has great trust and then you can start doing things like understanding why you're doing what you're doing, uh, building accountability and so on. But almost every time there's a, a lack of trust, especially if I'm being brought in, there's something that's not working. Like my example um, yeah. from uh, uh, my client in Miami, where um, there, there's the trust is just broken down between the tech team and everyone else. And, and the reason is that nobody's asking any questions. They're just doing. So uh, the, uh, I actually have a particular structure for doing this, which I didn't invent, um, uh, but I, I've got my own kind of engineering take on it. Um, it's called the ladder of inference. Um, your listeners, and you might have heard of it in a book called The Fifth Discipline um, 
Uh, it actually comes from social si social science research by a guy called Chris Argerus in the 1970s. Unfortunately, every book he wrote was completely unreadable. So um, my co-author and I had to go dig into his writings and, and really try to understand the ideas. But they're tremendously practical. Once you kind of translate them into meaningful language, they really help. The ladder of inference is a way of breaking down somebody else's story. How did they get from what they observe to how they act in a series of small steps? And the analogy I'll make for engineers is to a process engineers already use called tester and development. And in that process, you break down what a computer is doing into very small steps. And I say, well, let's just do that with humans. And they say, well, that sounds weird. I don't know, but I do understand it for computers. So, so how can we do it? And a, a, a a uh, TDD for people process or a ladder of inference process starts with asking the other person about what they observe, what they select from that, what's important about what they observe, what that means for them, how, what assumptions they make, what conclusions they draw, and so on up the ladder until you get to their actions. And if you do that very slowly, it can feel uncomfortable. So it's important to say, I'm going to ask you about your questions. But the diagnosis you get from that is so much more valuable because almost always you find something surprising halfway through and you say, I had no idea that you were thinking that. I had no idea that Judith had told you to do it that way. So now I understand why it's happening. Those kind of surprises are what you're after and they can change your mind and give you better language for building trust. So that's where I start. Mm -hmm. That's a good to start. So then what, what comes what comes next? Well, after that, generally, you discover once you've got some trust, people are willing to tell you about how afraid they are. And um, mm -hmm. it, uh, again, uh, especially in technology, um, where I come from, I, I coach a lot of salespeople and operations as well. But um, in, in technology, people think, oh, this is technology. We're all going to be doing rational things. It's like algebra. It's like mathematics. They're always going to be rational answers to things. Absolutely false. Uh, in every organization, there are very important fears. And um, if we didn't have fear, something would be wrong with us, right? We, we we evolved to have fear for good reason, so we'd run away from lions and things, right? So it, it's a valuable thing to have fear. The unfortunate thing is that people think you you shouldn't show any fear, shouldn't show any emotion like fear or, or anger or something like that in the workplace, and so they don't share it. And this leads to a, a, a the kind of error that you see that causes great catastrophes. That one one super analysis of this was of the Challenger spaceship that uh, exploded and lots of engineers knew what was wrong. They were very clear that this thing was gonna explode if you launched it and the, the weather was too cold, but they they didn't share it strongly enough. They didn't have the psychological safety to um, give that information. It wasn't able to bubble up to the people who were deciding who who had a rosy view of the situation and then killed, killed the astronauts. So uh, it doesn't necessarily lead to such a terrible result. But the most, a very important thing to clear before you can get on to anything else with uh, the team, uh, once you've got trust in place, is to understand what their fears are, get those clearly shared, and make sure it's safe for people to share them. Yeah, you know what that that does make uh, so much sense. I was talking to somebody who said, "Oh, I, you know, I've told, I told my boss that they, you know, need to do this because this is going to go wrong," and they're not they just keep ignoring me and I said did they hear it could they actually did you say it in a way that actually flags there's a real problem how much did you downplay it and I think you're, you're right it's just that sometimes people think just giving the message is enough when it's not the giving of the message it's whether the message is actually received one of the you great things in the challenger disaster was that um there were these PowerPoints and you can go back and read them. And, and the fourth or fifth bullet point in slightly smaller font, it says, by the way, don't launch the spaceship with the temperatures below this number. And um, the managers just saw all that and it seemed, uh, you know, everything, the headline would be everything is fine. <laughs> and fourth line down would be, oh, and there's a problem. Whereas you need to reverse those. And that's where the trust comes in. If you don't have the trust, yeah. you won't be willing to, to make that bold statement. Yeah, talking about bold statements, I've heard you say that, you know, the C-suite should do nothing as a way to allow a controlled failure. Mm. Tell controlled me failure is one of my favorites. Oh, I've just been talking about this. Mm. Tell me. So, yeah. So um, uh, here's an example from the tech world. Um, Netflix, who we all love to watch movies and, and TV shows and so on with, uh, streaming them to millions and millions of people all the time. They go to their computers and they have a special system that's set up 
to uh, destroy their computers, to literally take them offline, knock them out, make sure they're not working. And they do this to their live computers that are busy actually streaming information to you. Now, the don't when you're thinking about that, when you, you think, oh, gosh, you know, I, I had a little spinner on my Netflix the last time. That's not probably the reason, because what they're creating there is controlled failure. They're knocking out a data center or a, a rack of servers or something like that on purpose to make sure that there's something that seamlessly fixes that instantly without you noticing. If you had a problem because they're doing this, it's almost certainly not that it could be something else. So uh, in that case, they're, in that case, they're actually doing something to create controlled failure. Um, uh, but a, a similar thing you can do that's not technical is to uh, make sure that the people in your organization have the opportunity to fail in a safe way. So that mm. might look like this instead of you know, kind of uh, as in the Netflix example, going out and, and creating a problem, you could say, well, uh, I'm not sure whether this is going to work. I want to make sure we're accountable for uh, how it's going and that we can stop it. A new sales initiative in a new country, for example. We want to check in on that early, but go ahead and try it because one of several good things could happen. It, it could work. It could surprise you and not fail. That would be super. It could fail in some interesting way, and then you could learn from it and you could uh, adjust and tweak your strategy and be successful in that new country. Or that country is not right for you. It's the wrong place. But it's better to find that out and to know for sure. And so you can check in very early. So that that's my favorite um, uh, advice to um, uh, uh, managers who, who, who tend to be too active, who, who tend to be micromanagers, want to get in there and do things. They say, let it fail. And they go, oh, my God, it could fail. It would be terrible. Failure is bad. No, failure is useful. When an experiment fails, it tells you that something uh, is, is not a good idea. It's a negative result that's valuable. And I call that a success. Mm. Okay. I'm just trying to think. So whenever I'm trying to do something um, which has some risk to it, I would then, you know, you do your usual hypothesis, working it through, leading it out, making sure it's going to work. And then I flip it and think, what would happen if this part didn't work and what would happen if that didn't work? And then try with the team, work out, what would be the remedies of that and then making a decision on whether okay if it fails it's recoverable so that's mm -hmm. cool yeah uh, in technology we call that a pre-mortem so there's post-mortems you do after the patient dies right but you can yeah. do a pre-mortem -pre to go say how, how could the patient die what could go wrong uh what, how could this fail so that's a very useful the, process and keep doing the cycle so if you reach the point where if it fails there's no fix it's like hmm probably not worth going ahead yet until we can figure it out that yes we can recover if it fails exactly so that's not quite what you're saying is it that's not a controlled failure that's part of the planning phase i guess well um but it's a controlled failure in the sense that you're uh once you have those mitigations in place you might go ahead before you're certain so the, the yes, killer exactly. yes. the, the, the killer is when you say okay well we got to be really sure let's go back and study it some more oh what happens about this no. what, what if that goes wrong <laughs> can't do that right so you wouldn't be a maverick leader if you were doing that. No. <laughs> but what would be what would be really useful would be to go and try something and have it fail, but fail in an interesting way. So you learn something. That's what I would always tell people that uh, that worked for me in my in my employed days. I'd say, look, look, as long as you fail in an interesting way and in a new way, right? Don't fail the same way as last time. Then we will have learned something. Uh, you, you know, Judith, we have a really fascinating example of this um, that has a tech aspect to it. Um, ha have you seen any of the um, absolutely crazy transcripts from a uh, search engine called Bing from Microsoft? Have you seen any of that this past week? Yeah, I find it quite distressing reading them, actually. <laughs> but they're both distressing and entertaining. I was rolling on the floor with some of them because they're absolutely insane. Um, but what's happened there, and, and I think it's actually a really, um, it's an amazing coup by Microsoft. I think it's a great success in failing, right? So they're, they're, if it, people haven't seen this, the um, Bing has a, a chat feature now. So uh, you can go in and talk to Bing and say, well, Bing, can you look for this for me? And what about that? And so on. Well, people wind up talking to it about their love lives and about um, you know what year it is. And it insists it's, it's 1994 and things. It's, it's insane. Um, uh, and, and so it's quite crazy. It's kind of uh, somebody forgot to, to kind of set the, the flag that said, don't, don't do crazy things. Um, but what's happened is that we're all talking about Bing, which we certainly weren't before. It's not a very popular search engine. And they're learning a lot from all the things that this uh, chat function is doing wrong, which uh, I'm certain is the future of search in, in 
two years, we're all going to be just typing words into chat rather than um, uh, trying to, to guess what Google needs us to say in order to get the right thing. We'll just say, hey, could you find me some information on this topic? And so Microsoft is getting tons of free publicity. They're learning a ton from uh, uh, what's happening. And um, gosh, they're giving some entertainment to the rest of us. They're also scaring some of us, I agree. But uh, uh, that's a controlled failure, uh, which I'm very much in favor of. That's a very maverick move by them. Do you think that's why it's still there? And they've not taken it down. Oh, exactly. Yeah, I think this is a planned strategy, um, or or one that they're making up as they go, and they're 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 being pretty bright about it. Uh, I don't know that they necessarily said, "Let's make sure we release something that produces unintended humor and uh, uh, pretends to be an insane um, <laughs> beast uh, talking to our users." That's probably not how they planned it. But they probably said to themselves, they probably did a bit of a premortem. I hope they would have. And they would say, well, you know, if it kind of goes off the off the rails, what will we do? Well, we could yank it if it's really doing bad stuff, which it's not, right? It's not telling anybody build a bomb or, you know, something like that. It's not doing horrible things. But it's, um, uh, they said, and if it does kind of uh, medium things and it sort of fails in interesting ways, we, we can play that up and say we're learning and, and keep learning from it. So uh, I suspect that, that this is a planned action. Uh, if it's not, it's brilliant improvisation. And in either case, it's giving them great publicity and learning. So do you think then this is one of the reasons why their their, their um, stock market price didn't drop in such a significant way as their competitor did? I hope so. Um, I'm no, I, 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 I'm no um, uh, stock market whiz, so I, I don't know ever why the stock market does what it does. But um, if traders are smart, uh, they would not sell Microsoft based only on this. Uh, I'd, in fact, uh, say it's a, a positive sign. It's a reason to buy, not sell. Okay, thank you for that. So when you do these controlled failures, why do they bring teams together? Oh, good question. Well, um, uh, first of all, you're giving a very strong cultural message that that really uh, resonates, helps your team understand. Also, filters, people who don't like failure will go work someplace else, and that's good. Because what you want as a maverick leader is uh, a maverick team, right? You want people who are yeah. willing to experiment, try, push the boundaries, um, have successful experiments with a negative result. Let's listen to a quick advert. The Maverick Paradox. Judith Germain is an author, speaker, consultant, mentor and trainer, and the leading authority on maverick leadership. She is the founder of The Maverick Paradox, which supports organizations to enhance their leadership capabilities and to help business owners develop and grow their businesses. Judith enables individuals, business owners, and organizations to improve their impact and influence. She is also HR Zone's leadership columnist, and her expert opinion has appeared in national, international, and trade press. Welcome back to The Maverick Paradox. This is the podcast for the pathologically curious. Uh, there's a client I worked with. Um, uh, I worked with the whole um, uh, uh, leadership team to, to to shift completely from like six month planning cycles and and very detailed um, risk reduction to hey let's try something this week and they're they're doing like eight ten experiments a week many of which don't work um, and the result is that the the people in that organization are so energized they're saying okay what can we try tomorrow okay this one didn't work that's fine let's do something else the the kind of fear and um, the lack of trust and uh, psychological non-safety, those things are out the window because they're able to try lots of new things, um, which is very exciting, uh, especially to technical people. Um, the customers are um, interested in, and we, they've made sure to make these experiments safe. So it only affects some people and it's marked as a beta test and so on. Uh, so uh, it's not uh, undermining their confidence. And um, uh, when they get a success, they really know it's a success because they've experimented with it. Okay, cool. That sounds good. Tell me what action science is. Oh, boy. So this is the thing I referred to early, uh, earlier. This is this um, notion from Chris Argyris in the 1970s. He's a highly, highly academic guy. Um, so his papers, well, they're impenetrable. You, know, you need a, uh, an afternoon and, a, and a, a stiff drink to, to try to understand one page. But the great thing is he actually did experiments with people. And uh, he discovered uh, by recording conversations very carefully that um, there were actual conversational techniques that you could use. They weren't the natural things, they not the things we just do when we sort of do, do things without thinking. But if you practice 
you can develop skills for all the things we've been talking about, building trust, um, uh, running experiments, make, uh, reducing fear, and so on. Uh, so I wrote a whole book with my co-author called Agile Conversations, in which we took uh, a lot of Argyris' ideas and um, help, help get them out of the academia academic world. Um, there, there's lots of other examples of this. I referred to Senga's fifth di discipline. That's another um, uh, in the same uh, 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 academic uh, direction. All of these things, all of these techniques are aimed at reducing defensiveness and increasing your uh, maverick ability to uh, learn, build trust and experiment. I'm loving the sound of that. How would I get hold of your your work? Uh, well, the uh, best place to go is DouglasSquirrel.com, uh, which has links to everything. Uh, the book is called Agile Conversations. The podcast is called Troubleshooting Agile, but they're all linked from DouglasSquirrel.com. And another good place to go is SquirrelSquadron.com, uh, which is my community of tech and non-tech people getting together and learning from each other. Uh, and I have free events and um, uh, 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 weekly emails and uh, loads of uh, material there for, for people. So DouglasSquirrel.com, SquirrelSquadron.com are the two places to go. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And before we end, Douglas, is there anything you want to leave us with? Uh, uh, keep talking. Uh, it's amazing how many people tend to shut down, stop asking questions, and uh, just try to uh, uh, bowl, bowl their way ahead. And that can sound like a maverick action. But the real maverick is somebody who listens carefully, um, falsifies their ideas, gets new ideas from their team, and tries something new every day. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Glad to be. Thank you. And thank you out there for tuning in to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where through conversations with our guests, we demonstrate that Maverick leadership exists everywhere. I am Judith Germain, your host, and I hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with Douglas as much as I enjoyed having it. Mm -hmm.